Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Money Talk. I'm Johnny. And I am Teresa. And today we have with us Mr. Matthew and Miss Sailor. And we're going to be discussing being married and young. How y'all doing tonight? Doing pretty good. Thank you for asking. Wonderful. Matthew, we'll start with you. And can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you, please? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Matthew Corcoran uh, from Virginia, born and raised seven cities and just now just giving everything I have to impact the youth and the next generation coming up in whatever capacity that looks like. Wonderful. All right, All right you, Miss Sayla. And my name is Sayla Corcoran. Um, I'm originally from Georgia. <clears throat> Sorry, y'all. <laughs> I'm off being sick this week. Um, I'm currently a full-time student at Capella University to be a marriage and family therapist. I am a wife, of course, and a mom of two. And I'm just excited to be here. Wonderful. Right. And so... Based on my memory, each of you have some military experience. Can you tell the audience a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, uh, I served in the uh, United States Army, same as uh, my wife said. I was uh, 15 Tango, which is a UH-60 Black Hawk mechanic, crewed in the medevac for about four years, and now just have this burning passion for if it flies, I want to be able to either convey that information to others or do what I can to help it fly better, fix it, instruct, whatever that looks like. Wonderful. Nice. Okay. I do say, like he said, I'm in the Army. It's funny because we were originally supposed to both be in the Air Force, but he <laughs> pulled before I did, and that didn't, you know, it didn't happen for him, and then subsequently it didn't happen for me. And so I joined the Army. Originally, I was supposed to be a, um, a uh, like, phlebotomist in the military. Mm-hmm. 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 Unfortunately, I wasn't able to pass the AIT situation. They reclassed me to be a fueler, and I ended up getting stationed in the aviation unit. So I was fueling the helicopters that he was working on, and he was a crew chief on. So that's kind of how our uh, military experience and how we kind of met and been in the same units. Wonderful. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know what you didn't share with us, Matthew, is what you do now as a career, now that you're no longer in the Army. Uh, Well... Everybody says in the military, there's life after the military. And I guess the the second life that I got to live still has the essence of aviation. So right now I'm a AMP instructor. I teach, I have taught every single block, which I'm saying blocks, but uh-huh. there's segments of information that cover every component of an aircraft. And I have taught every single one from start to finish. And right now I'm actually a pilot in a program in Norfolk, Virginia, teaching high schoolers right now uh, the beginning four blocks of this career so that if they so choose to as they graduate they can segue right into it and can almost be making sixty thousand dollars starting at 19 years old wonderful wonderful you keep going with that mission because we need these people to work on these airplanes and make them work safe for us that's true yeah absolutely well well thank you for your introduction and and all the background um i was army at one point in time too so you said Yeah, so I I absolutely understand it. And it is life after the military. Uh, So how many children do y'all have and what are the ages? So right now we have two children, two girls. Uh, One is five, one is two. Uh, They are both just bundles of joy. And we love pouring into them and watering them to see the beautiful flowers they grow up to be. Yeah. All right. So So how long have y'all been married? Yeah. 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 How long have y'all been married? (laughs) (laughs) That's where it's from. (laughs) <laughs> um, so we've been married for seven years. Now. Okay, all right. Years, and it's it's been a beautiful journey to go through our our young twenties into now our budding thirties of just experiencing life together and how we can see each other just mature and just mold into newer creations every day. It's just awesome. Nice. Well, I like that new creations every day. Yeah, they pretty gifted. Yeah, I, I like that. I have to use that one. New creations every day. <laughs> um. So. Let's dive into some some questions here. So how when you first got married, you know, I know my wife, we first got married. We were young, like y'all. When y'all first got married, what was you alls situation? Did you go out and purchase a home, live in an apartment? What was that situation? How did that look? Well, so so when we first got married, you know, you you're in the military. Well, you were in the military. So you understand when you get married, you get B.A.H., right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. what we ended up doing was we went apartment shopping together. We we were stationed in El Paso and me and Matthew both knew that wasn't where we wanted to plant roots. like plant roots. You know what I mean? It was our first duty station. El Paso is not bad. It's a beautiful city. Great things. We just knew 
life outside. We looked ahead, life outside the military, we didn't see ourselves there. So we got a really nice apartment in a gated community on the east side of El Paso. And we got it for a really good deal because we signed up for it right around tax season. So we mm -hmm. had a $1,200 apartment, two full bed, two full bath for nine fifty. Mm -hmm. Oh, y'all wow. oh, did good. They did good. <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> And so, uh, and it was real safe too. There's police officers that live there. You don't have to worry about any problems. I mean, the east side is a nice area in El Paso. So we, we rented. Mm -hmm. we Absolutely. And so, yeah. So how long did y'all stay in El Paso? So I spent my uh, entire military career in El Paso. Mm -hmm. um, and wow. when we got married in 2017, we got that apartment. We actually stayed there till, I want to say about, December, right before 2019. Right. And uh, as we both transitioned out of the military, it was, we learned so much. El Paso was just a, a beautiful place that that really matured us in ways that mm -hmm. set us up mm -hmm. and, and really didn't take from us in, in, in certain aspects. And so we got a good taste of what it's like to be on your own, to be financially responsible for, mm -hmm. you know, power, certain types of utilities, car insurance, things like right. that. And so it's just it was just like adding tools to your tool bag really that's what el paso gave to us mm -hmm. okay well my burning question is what made you all decide to transition out of the military mm. no no okay. this <laughs> so i had a problem with just it's been it's been a constant thread through my whole life of everything i do i want to do it to my best ability and even if it's something that is detrimental to me physically or emotionally, I will try to truck through it. So mm -hmm. there were a lot of opportunities I was given in the army where I could go to certain schools and, and try to be a PT stud and shoot and, and move and do all those things. And I was actually going to go uh, special forces. I had a slot and everything and oh. it me injury. And so my slot kind of got taken from me and okay. lost a little bit of morale, but ultimately went to more schools and kept on going. Well, as a crew chief, uh, you actually fly with the helicopters that you work on. They We pull real world missions. And in the medevac, you are, at any moment, somebody's life could be on the line and you are the, the next up emergency care to provide them, to take them from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And with that comes responsibilities as in you have to stay current on your uh, flight status. And so there were some, some flights that pilots, I'm not going to blame a pilot, but ultimately pilots have to learn too. And I didn't have the best, I didn't sit with the best posture. I kind of sat like I was just some thug uh, sitting in the back, calling calling the aircraft around. And I guess just the amount of vibrations helicopters produce and the amount of inertia that it has as it contacts the ground actually did cause a spine injury. And uh, I actually mm -hmm. could not do the job to the best of my ability anymore physically. And so I had mm -hmm. the opportunity to be medically discharged from service. Wow. And Sayla, what made you decide to transition out along with him? So... I know you haven't asked quite this question. I mean, this is going to lead into some of them questions, but I don't think I got to tell you, Miss Teresa, me getting out the military has a big part to do with my testimony, like with God and everything. Mm -hmm. So um, this will probably be the first time I ever shared this story on like a platform of any kind. So bear with me. <laughs> um, Go right on. So when I was in the service, unfortunately, I was sexually assaulted three different times. And by the time I came to El Paso, and this was within a four month period, like boom, boom, boom. And two of them were in El Paso. And that's actually um, around the time me and Matthew met. So it all kind of ties into a lot of things. So I had PTSD due, under you know, understandably to being mm -hmm. assaulted. And I had been in counseling for some years in that period, trying to work through it, trying to get through it and everything. Well, my PTSD has started to affect my sleep a lot. And um, I had... To, I had tried to get into therapy sessions where I was supposed to, and me and my therapist would be like playing a phone tag. She'd have an appointment, she had to cancel, she has to do this. I couldn't meet with her. And so I started self-medicating with marijuana while I was in the service. Um, nobody knew, and it wasn't for a long period of time. It started probably like November-ish. Um, December came around, and they usually don't UA until after break. I kind of figured out the schedule for it. And one particular day when I decided to use, I heard the Lord tell me, what if they UA? And I was like, they don't, they don't do that. They don't do that. And I did. And then that night I got a text from my sergeant saying, hey, everybody meet at the hangar at 4 a.m., which you already know it's about to be. So I did the UA. I called Matthew. I was like, babe, you know, they UA'd me today. Da, da, da. He was like, 
you just smoked yesterday. I was like, I know. He's like, all right, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I didn't find out I was pregnant with Rosalina until late that December. Mm -hmm. so January, I get a call from my first sergeant, all of them, because obviously I popped up on the, you're mm -hmm. now having marijuana in my system. And they started the, the process actually to discharge me out the military article 15. And I remember going to my car. I was pregnant. Matthew was already transitioning out because of his medical stuff. And I cried out to God. I really did. I was like, Lord, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do. Like, I know I messed up, but da, da, da. and the Lord told me you will not get kicked out the military. And so this was January. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to get kicked out the military. In the meantime, I'm also enrolled in ASAP with a counselor who's a Christian. Shout out to Mr. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> he started pouring into me with scripture because I told him I was Christian too. I'm like, well, I'm a believer. And, da, 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 this. and he was like, okay, so we would have our sessions and he would help me. But then he would also give me scripture at the end of it to meditate on throughout the week. And I told him, I said, Mr. Jackson, uh, I feel like God told me I'm not supposed to get kicked out the military. And he was like, well, if the Lord told you that, you know, stand on it. And all my sergeants. So now we're in April. It's been four months of me getting processed out. It's me and four other people, by the way. I wasn't by myself. It was four other people. And I was a part of the process of getting chaptered out you have to get psychologically evaluated. Mm -hmm. And the day I, let me go back, the day that I found out I got in trouble for marijuana, I also went to the therapist I had been seeing at the time. And I told her, hey, I got a UA, I got in trouble, da, da, da. And she started looking through my paperwork and seeing that I had tried to see her before I self-medicated. Like I had, Ooh. in that process, I've been trying to reach out to her and get to her and we couldn't meet up. Mm -hmm. And so she understood and she never judged me for it. I was a great soldier. I was at the top of my unit at the time. And so this is April. So it's been four months. People tell me you're going to get kicked out. I'm in the process. I'm in the last step of getting kicked out. Mm -hmm. and I get a call from the psychologist who is supposed to do our, you know, our evaluations for getting out. And he calls me and he's like, you're not getting an art. You're not getting chaptered out. He was like, you're getting med boarded out. They didn't tell you. And I was like, no. And he was like, you're a therapist. She already spoke to me and explained to me the situation. And your situation is grounds for medical boarding because I had been in therapy for two years. So it was technically, um, I can't remember the specific term, but it's basically when you can't adjust into the military anymore. Due to a medical reason, my instance is PTSD. Uh -huh. And then for it being, she has PTSD using marijuana. It's all linked together due to the military sexual trauma that happened to her. Mm -hmm. So my article 15 turned into a medical board, which got me disability mm -hmm. as we got out. Mm -hmm. so, okay. okay, so... That's how that happened. So I found out in April, my situation turned from an article 15 to medical board. They start evaluating me. I get my percentage. Um, Matthew gets out first. I have the baby. And then I get out in that January, then a few months after that. So that's how I ended up um, getting out the military through medical board. But that started the process to me getting back with God. God had been trying to get me back since 2000. 16 ish when the very last assault had taken place and i had mm -hmm. stopped talking to him obviously because i was hurt and just different things and it really wasn't until i met matthew that i started praying again because he's cute <laughs> i like to <laughs> 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 God, it's like uh -huh. talk to you now you know what i mean like i don't know i gotta talk to you and so <laughs> you to indirectly being some uh force that helped me to like i know i need to talk to god again because i don't i want to mm -hmm. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? But God had been trying to get me back with him through that whole process. And even during that time, God was there with me using Mr. Jackson, looking through scriptures. Matthew was so patient with me because I did have military sexual trauma. And that does affect the marriage when I'm mm -hmm. trying to things. And just so patient and loving through the whole process of it. And even Rosalina, when I got pregnant with her, I realized I can't, I can't keep doing this. You know, I can't, I can't be selfish in how I handle this situation. Like, mm -hmm to go to the therapy i need to pray i need to get back right with god i need to listen to my worship music i need to fill myself up with things that are holy because i can't get through this alone and i need to be the best i can be for my husband of course but for this future child i'm about to have especially having a daughter i want to be able to i don't want her to have a mother who had the opportunity to get better and chose mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. she's hurting because i didn't take the proper steps so that's the story slash half testimony well thank you for sharing that that's a yeah, big story that's a huge story i mean it's gonna help somebody yeah, else yes and i know it's gonna touch somebody in our audience so thank you for kind of breaking that down and sharing your story because that that was wild 
It was. Yeah. So, so, so after you went through all of this, you and Matthew, mm -hmm. and after you got the military, what did your life look like after the military? Where did you wind up? Did you wind up going to rent another apartment, staying with family? How, how did that look? So in this, in this transition, in that late December, when she's finalizing her transition out, we have a newborn and I'm already transitioned out. And now it's like, where to next, God? Mm -hmm. That's right. We put a map down and looked at all our options. I got family in Colorado. We had family in Texas at a time. We had family in Georgia. We had family in Virginia. And we really weighed the options of what it looked like growing up, having our girls grow up near um, sorry, she's going to let it clean I'm gonna out. I'm going to let the dog out. Sorry, y'all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> she want to be on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we really wanted to have an accurate picture of what it looks like growing up our girls in an area around certain family and, and like that, just that community. And I remember we were sitting there praying and God laid on my heart that you need to go back to Virginia. Mind you, this is this at this point in time in, in that day and age. I was against coming back to Virginia because I'm like, I know that environment in that area. I didn't want to go back there, right? Mm -hmm. And so we trekked across the country uh, with Queen and Rosie and all our stuff. And we got, got back to Virginia. And we went to my parents' house. And in our hearts, we spoke about so many times. We we're like, this is just a pit stop. We're going we're gonna to move to the next place and next season. What does that look like? And 2019 came quick, fast, and hurry. And it felt like we were just on this wave of this rush of so many things are changing because you we have just been removed from the source of certainty that we just knew that was the military. In the car. And, oh, Jesus. Sailor was in a car accident. So we had two vehicles. I had a Chrysler 300. She had a Chrysler 200. And she was driving my car back and forth to work when we still lived in El Paso. And she was T-boned by a work truck. As she was going through a green light, a guy was having a heart attack in a work truck and t on her. And I'm at home with, with Rosie and it's, it's wintertime. So this is December. It's pretty cold. And I just mm -hmm. get a phone call from her, you know, voice shaking. But she's like, hey, babe, I was just T-boned in the car. And I said, where are you? I'm coming right now. So I, I put the baby in, in the little, you know, <laughs> and I, I went to the front desk because she had the car seat. Mm -hmm. It's like, I need somebody to drive me up the street while I sit in the back and hold the baby. So I'm not driving with a baby. And so the front desk people take me up the street and she walked away with sprained wrist. Yeah, that's it. God, God is good. Our was total. Yeah. And, and all I could care about was that the things that we invest in, obviously God has a built-in security where when you steward over them, right. And, and that car was our built-in security. It was one of the, the, the uh, fire departments. Like this is one of the safest vehicles to actually, if it's a mid-size sedan, this is what you would mm -hmm. want to get hit in if you did. And so mm -hmm. thankful for that. So now we're going from two vehicles to one vehicle going across the country. So now this mm -hmm. is a whole big uh, 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 dynamic shift for us. And, when we got to my parents' home, they opened up their house with open arms. And uh, my parents, I, I grew up with five, four siblings, so I'm the fifth child. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, I, I, I'm being, being transparent. We grew up not in, in lack. We grew up in lack in, in many different occasions, okay? Mm -hmm. And my parents' hearts never changed. Yeah. If they had it, they will help mm -hmm. until they don't have it. Right. Almost, mm -hmm. too, almost like it's a fault that they're helping, right? Mm -hmm. And when God brought us into their home and into their dwelling place, when we crossed that threshold, it was like we declared that, okay, we were supposed to be. And the room that they made for us and and the freedom that they gave, yeah. it did, I, I, and this is just me being transparent, it did not feel like I was living with my parents. Yeah. It felt like we had genuine roommates yeah. who we can communicate to mm -hmm. and we both value each other. And at the end of the day, we can come together. And so bonds kind of grew that mm -hmm. I didn't have as a child, you know, now as a young adult and with my wife and my, my daughter. And mm -hmm. so when we stayed there, Sayla started going to school, getting her degree. And I, I eventually started going to school. And so now with us both in school and, and having Rosalina, we, it, life felt so busy to just really prioritize what we should have been prioritizing, which could have been like our finances and setting up things. And so the the momentum that we kind of ursur ursur up in that house really set a path that even when people came to visit they're like it just feels different just 
just the the spirit that is resting over this house just feels different because of open lines of communication. And and I and I pray that that was something that we were able to leave my parents that whenever we transitioned out that they can keep this foundation of hey like even though we are always willing to help we we have we know what we stand for we have our standard and if you're not meeting that standard we're not going to put ourselves in jeopardy just to appease and and so we always pray that God we never want to be a a, a burden on somebody we want to be a blessing how can we leave it how can we be how can we be Abraham to uh, uh, Hagar how can we leave this with a blessing right yeah. and so mm-hmm. putting that all into the the blender of reality right that process took five years. And being five in okay. five years, being in one room with in a frog, yeah. In a frog, a finished room above the garage, right? Thank you. Yeah. Because some people yeah. may not know what that is. Yeah. Yeah. A finished room <laughs> above the garage. That means every time the garage door opens, you hear it, no matter the time of day. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't have the best ventilation just because it's not as insulated as the rest of the house. Yeah. And yeah. and mind you, we're coming from we had our own two bedroom, two bath apartment, right. and all that's being minimized right. to this. Space. And and so it, it, it was like take take the blindfold off of of privilege and really humble yourself to to have a perspective of where you're at. And when we gained that, it was it was like how can we magnify the the position that we're in, regardless of the season, how it looked. I don't I don't care that I'll see leaves on this tree. I know the roots that are planted are in the right soil. That's right. So that's how we really went through every single trial and tribulation. COVID happened. Right. Uh. Uh, mm-hmm. going through school, relying on our finances through the GI Bill. Oh, yeah. And then and that got cut. I had the GI Bill in my school that I was doing stop and they went online. So sure. we went fifteen hundred from my GI two hundred from his to cut to eight hundred. And I didn't expect that to take place till I started my master's when I knew all of it was so mm-hmm. there, we are financially contributing at this point in time to his and we have, you know, children, a child at the time. And so situations were happening, you know, where the finances and that's when we started uh not fasting, but tithing too. In 2019, mm. we started tithing. We were like, okay, every Lord, increase, every increase, we'll just give you 10% and see, you know, what you do with what it. You, because money was my idol. I'll be honest with you. I, um, uh, I talk grew- about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Can you yeah. talk about that money? <laughs> yeah. 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 Hit, Somebody hit, need to hear hit, that. Hit on that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Listen, money was my idol mm. and it burnt a hole in my pocket like no mm. other. Ever since I'm a child, I couldn't like, I, cause to me, money was value. You got money. You're somebody. You know, when you can buy this yourself the things that you want to buy, that's that's when we have. And then when I don't have money, it's very depressing. It sucks, right? But tithing was always so hard for me because one, you know, God's a spirit. Like, he don't need it. And two, like, don't say that again. Yeah, yeah. Say that a little louder. Oh, oh God's a spirit. He don't need, um, he don't need money. So I was like, oh, God, he don't need money. You know what I mean? And then I'm like, when I give you this 10%, the church, you know, the 10%, which is God's bride and so so it adds to the kingdom i'm like that's 10 percent i don't have and given how tight our situation was matthew's the one who who was like tithing because i was not i was not i mean i wasn't like we not about to do that but i was definitely like um everything <laughs> don't have to tie. i mean we already don't have place we got one car we both in school mm. you know like the monies that we get isn't even like we just have money to blow after everything. Like it's already just God hit two birds with the one stone of tie that and 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 to paint that picture be vivid was I didn't have locks. I had I had my hair out at this time. And she was Sailor was braiding my hair one day and I'm sitting back in a chair, rosaling asleep, and it's about so I have sleep apnea and insomnia. So it'd be like Two in the morning, and I got school at six a.m. Yeah. And I'm like, I gotta get my hair braided, babe. I can't go to school looking crazy. So we're watching a sermon called "Beyond Blessed" by Pastor Robert Morris, and he's just talking about the benefits of tithing and how how you can benefit through your sowing seeds into the kingdom, and and then God blessing your ninety rather than working with a cursed hundred. So I'm just listening. I'm just well, so- let's go back. Say that sentence one more time. Well, yes. Okay, so. Hearing that, I I heard that it is better to work with a blessed 90 than a cursed 100. Amen. Damn. Okay, keep going. <laughs> yes. And so as as that, as I soaked that up, it, I got convicted in the moment. I said, that means any increase. That means that means time efforts. That means that means what I can do with mm-hmm. with say something. I was like, hey, I just want to bless you with $10, brother. Who is a dollar? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and and yeah, and yeah. and just <laughs> it and almost made it 
I know it, 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 if if you if you blow it up, it's like you almost made it robotic. Where it's like, is that really a discipline? But it's like if you if you can subconsciously submit this in your heart, then now I don't have to question why am I giving this ten percent. I'm not even calculating the hundred that I see. Mm -hmm. I'm already saying God's portion's already taken out. Right. So if anything has to get bought and it's more than this amount, it ain't getting got because yeah. that's already God's. It's already in God's uh, hands mm -hmm. to do what He wills with. Mm -hmm. So the first stone was, you know, me as the head of the house uh, falling in line with what God had for us to be obedient to was was that the second stone was now I got to convince my wife that anytime we have funds that we have to and mind you we're still contributing and we're still paying for food and formula and all these things so <laughs> dollars look good when they're in the account but now every every month or every two weeks she sees okay this portion's getting getting taken out and and now there's conversation that had to be had which just obviously made us have a, a open, more clear lines of communication that now when when she when I say something, she could trust it because she's seen the results. And then I can trust her when I'm saying, hey, babe, this is what we're doing. Do I have support? Yeah. And so it really just it really just emboldened our foundation in our marriage, but then also gave us this covering. Mm -hmm. still. Right. And faith, because mm -hmm. when I tell you, we've never been in lack. Wow. Say that. Tied. And that, that, that's right. Say, say, right. That one, say, say that one more time. You need to repeat that. Yeah, say, yeah, say it loud and say it again. Yeah, we've yeah, never been in lack since we've tied. And and it's not, our finances have lowered okay. <laughs> significantly before. And we still tied the 10% and we always had what we needed. And God has always blessed us that we were living comfortably in that. Not like we've never been in lack and I just got just enough. No, it's always been if we still want to go out to eat, if we still want to do a date night, if we still need to get the girl something. It was always still able to happen, not to mention it blessed the household we were in because mm. my in-laws, they, I, I don't believe they were, you know, they didn't, we, we were the first people to really try tithing and stuff like that. But even their household wasn't in lack. Like, it's almost like the Lord was blessing us and then blessing where we were. Because mind you, they're opening their home to us in this time. I know is the will of God and God is covering them because you are helping, you know what I mean? You're helping them. So there's a whole covering that's all taking place, but we've never been in lack at like ever, like at all. I never, I, I mind you, I was a student the whole time. I never had to go out and get a job. Matthew was able to go to school and then start working. We were still, we had it. At, we had a baby. The Lord told us to have a baby in the midst of all. We're 2021, 2021. And the mm -hmm. Lord is like, have another kid. And I'm like, we don't have our own place. Yes. Okay. It didn't Matthew's make sense. not even out of school yet. Right. Where are we? Babies are money. And we didn't, right? That's our youngest baby coming through. And we still weren't in lack. Not, it, the numbers I, don't make sense. I used, to God say, does it. I used to say in that time when we were in that season, I used to say this mm -hmm. all the time. I said, I would say, we serve a God who does not know how to pour a drink. And everybody be like, what are you talking about? I say, because when you hold your cup up, to the to the to to heaven as he's pouring down from the window of heaven, he gonna keep on pouring you like God is full and it's gonna overflow. And you need to tell the people who are around you to get their cups ready to catch this overflow because that's just how it, it just it yeah. continues going when you when you steward over what you are to do right. right. And so when I learned that, I was like, well, I guess I just I just better be rain jacketed up and tell the people who are around me that I love come close. <laughs> yes, okay. Lady. So when y'all got out of the military and went to your in-laws, mm -hmm. did y'all have a plan as to how long y'all were going to stay there? Or it was just like, we I don't know how long we're going to be there. And it's so crazy because every veteran that I know got the same story where it's like, we get out and we're going to go to school and then GI Bill going to cover everything. Like, that's what we were told. That's what we believed. I was like, oh, we're going to get out. I'm going to go to school. He's going to go to school. We're going to have two GI Bills and we're going to be here just for a few months and we're going to go. And never had. And every time, because we would get in frustration, we're like, you know, we want to have our own place. I want to be my own, you know, da, da, da. let's go look for places to rent. No, finances never worked out. They didn't want a dog. You know, we have a dog, don't want a dog. Um, the deposit for the dog is just too much to continue on top of what we're trying to pay. Mm -hmm. And so, and the Lord will always tell us to wait. We'd fast and be like, all right, Lord, tell us where to go. And he'd be like, wait on the Lord. Mm. Wait. Mm. So with Matthew being the head of the house, when you went into your parents' house, mm -hmm. did you have in your mind also that y'all were only going to be there for a few months and then use the GI Bill to get out? 
being honestly, being honest yeah. in that birthday moment of walking through that threshold. I remember that day when I hugged my mom, it was like midnight yeah. and I hugged my mom standing there immediately. I was like, now we got to figure out how to get out. It, it was it's crazy. <laughs> but but, but <laughs> honest, that's how I felt. And, and you know what? And hear this. In that whole first year, it was like I had I had like an identity crisis of like, I mean, for lack of a better uh, image, I felt like I was on a plantation. I got it. How can how can I do? What can I do? I'm going crazy just believing that I'm a, I'm a husband, a father, and I'm, I'm here in this this house with my parents and it's one bedroom and, and just let, you know what? The, enemy, the guy showed me this the other day. The enemy will tell you the fact, but withhold the truth. So all I saw were the facts. The facts were on paper. The facts were black and white. Yeah, you were you are a military veteran, disabled veteran, you and your wife. And, and you do have children and you are living with you. And yeah, you do have aspirations to go and be more, but Look at your situation right now. And I couldn't see past. So that that put a that put a, a constraint on every relationship. That put a that put a, a damper on my psyche. It it would it would affect Sailor and I's communication in that in that immediate time. Because mind you, like I said, that transition period, a lot of people don't tell you, yes, there is life after the military. They don't tell you that those those separation <laughs> pains of like, I just had the most security I could ever have. And now I don't. What do I, what do I wear? I just wore the same thing for years. Now I got to choose my own clothes. W when do I eat? Nobody's telling me when lunch is and doing all these things, having to relearn it. It was like rewiring myself. And, and I, I have a, I have a idea, uh, a idea of how people get out of the military. I say, I've met a lot of people from the military. <laughs> I say, whatever age you went into the military and then what, and then you get out, those years that you spent in are kind of like like in Remember limbo. That. When you get out, you're kind of now entering the age from when you joined. So if you were 19 when you joined and you were in for 20 years, you're going to get out and you're going to be like 20, 21. That's how your brain's feeling because that was the last time you were actually on your own, a civilian. And now you got to kind of like mature from there. Now, it's not going to take a long time to get back to where you're at, but it, it is this shock. And so now I was 19 again, even though I was married and had a child and having to go through those, having to walk back the other way. It, it, it took some time. So so there, was, there wasn't like a real timeline. It was more of like a heart posture and a mentality. I, I wouldn't even have been healthy to lead my family if we would have went from my parents' house to a, to a location in, in a week. Mm -hmm. We probably would have been right back in my parents' house. And they'd be like, I told you you should have took all your stuff. And so... <laughs> yeah. so, 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 do you, so do you think your parents... Uh, by staying with your parents uh, for, I guess, five years, do you think that helped you and, and Sailor and, and they mentored you and kind of provided that guidance y'all need as a married couple during that time? So my parents have been married since they were 20 years old. My mother just turned 61. My father will be one this summer. So almost 40, 42 years, right? 41 years, right? And seeing and and I've lived through the ups, the downs. The, you know, they say for better or for worse. I'm I'm a child seeing the for better and the worse. I'm like, oh yeah. It's, it's it's a it's a sobering effect when you see it. And mm -hmm. now now actually being in a partnership where it's like, okay, wow. Um, how can when I say smart people learn from what other people have done and don't have to go through it themselves? I mm -hmm. say, how can we steal the good things that people have done and learn from the bad things they have done? And and so we ain't gotta do that. And so seeing how every day my father would come home and the first person he goes to see is my mother or seeing how even if this is a show that either of them don't want to watch they sit in there together watching uh oh. seeing how if if i went somewhere to eat to get something to eat and say i had my my father with me he not going to just get something to eat for him and not be like well, what are we getting for for your mother and obviously i'm the same way with sailor i'm like i ain't coming back without nothing i ain't about to get you <laughs> but uh it was it was this weird parallel to be able to to peek in intimately to somebody's you can't I, I say this to my students the other day I say you can fake the funk for about three weeks but after that twenty four seven them 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 veils fall off and we're gonna have to see the real you so imagine living with somebody twenty four seven for five years I got Sailor got to know my mama more than I think any of my siblings know my mama <laughs> and then me and my father were able to speak about things that. He hasn't spoke to anybody about just because of that that intimacy. 
and mm-hmm. in that relationship and in, in that proximity. And so God really blessed us with having like like front row seats to okay, y'all want to take this for real? Y'all want to see y'all want to see a, a a life just from a different person's uh, point of view? And then then I'll give you that. And so we've been like like I believe that's part of the uh, the blessing with the that's 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 Lucy. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, I believe that's part of the blessing with just, you know, tithing, steward over what we, we were supposed to do right and, and then being legitimate in all situations, whatever that looks So how did, and you know, I got to get Sayla's perspective, but until she comes back, we're going to get your perspective. Okay. How okay. did living in your parents' home, even though you were in a room over the garage, how did that affect your marriage? So Sayla and I were young when we got married. How old were you when you got married? I was 21. Okay. All right. And so actually we both were 21. She had just turned 21. So like we're just 21, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. going day in and day out of experiencing ups and downs just through we're not in our own home. So mm-hmm. I'm the man of my household. There's another man of this house. This mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's not a there's not a oh, yeah freedom there to say hey it's the middle of the night you would like to walk to the restroom because you woke up in the middle of the night and me have a nightgown on now i have to put on a robe and my night shoes to walk down the hall because at any moment in time another adult is in the house and there's mm-hmm. a couple that's there and 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 so now us having these intimate conversations Sailor and i of babe this can't be all that our life is going to be and and now she's relying on me to you know give the hope Kind of paint the paint the make it plain, paint the image, make it plain, and, and show the plan. Because now God's saying, okay, when you make the plan, Matthew, and 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 you get in line with me, and Sailor comes up under you as the net to support the head, then we can go. But I was having a hard time. I was in the cloud of of confusion of how can I how can I lead us the best way. I I got uh, paralysis by analysis trying to just go where I thought mm-hmm. we should. So that put a that put a. I don't want to say amnesty between us, but it definitely felt like a wedge. It kind of, it, it, we couldn't get as close as we like to because now there's so many things that we need to just air out and and get on the same page on. Imagine I'm in the, the back of the book thinking like, how am I going to write this biography? And she's on the front page like, what's next? And, and we, there was a disconnect there. So it took some time and, and open lines of communication, but I believe we were in the best uh, environment to mm-hmm. do that. And knew that we were somewhere safe. Okay. So, well, Sailor's perspective. Yeah, I'm late. I'm gonna say something, but yeah, go ahead. Get Sailor's uh, perspective. But no, you might forget. Go ahead. So, one of the things that you said earlier, Matthew, was about roots, right? So, being at your, from my perspective, hearing you, being at your parents' home allowed you and Sailor to gain roots. Mm. I mean, some good roots in in good soil, right? Mm. Because you know there's. There's four types of, of soils, and one of those soils is the, the good soil where you can get rooted and produce a lot of fruit, right? You can right. produce. And, and so that's what you did. So with that, now you're seeing the fruit in your life because of your the soil that you were planted in. That's now right. you're seeing the fruit. So I'm going to let my wife, before I go, I'm going to let my wife get Sailor's point of view on this because I'm sure she has a perspective just like you do. But I, I really like what you said because you're right. I mean what you got from your parents by being at your parents' house really probably has set you and Sailor up for success even beyond what you can see now. So yeah, that's that's awesome. Yes. Sailor, I want to know from you, being the woman of the house, mm-hmm. how did living with your in-laws impact your marriage? Well, so Mrs. C is an amazing woman. First of all, if you see his face, he has his mother. He has his mother's face. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a model there. He's a model. She is. I mean, she is so amazing. Like his mom, his both his parents, but I'm going to speak on his mom because I spend the most time with her. Um, She's a stay at home wife. Mm-hmm. And, and so she is such a light in the world. Like she radiates beauty physically, but in, inside she's such a beautiful, mm-hmm. hospitality has to be her gift because she can make anybody feel at home. And when you're at her place, you want to live and stay there forever. She's just that type mm-hmm. of thing. So when I first got there, I, I got depressed. I already had my mm-hmm. PTSD stuff going on. You know, we're here. We don't know what's going on. The, so for a while, I stayed up in that room with my daughter by myself. And I just didn't leave. Um, his family barely got to know me before we got married. We, I met them, what, for two weeks? Mm-hmm. We came down to leave for my birthday. Everybody's like, oh, it's his girlfriend. Ah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We left. We went on a flight home and when we got off that plate we got married 
And his family was very much like, y'all did what? This was like wife. Like he wanted to marry her. Like this is, I mean, Matthew don't just bring women around. So they knew it was something serious. But so I said, I said we didn't, I didn't have much experience with his family. Mm-hmm. So from that to living with them, I was very concerned about my image and how I have to be because I mean, I'm in, I'm in the house with his brother. And and she's very good at letting people be adults. She doesn't baby any or coddle anybody. But mm-hmm. sure, you know, like if you had to live with your husband's mom, it's like, you know, there's certain things about myself that I need to get together because if it comes out with his mom around, it might be like, girl, what are you doing? So mm-hmm. I was depressed and I stayed in my room and I called my mother a lot. And she was like, this is a beautiful opportunity for you to build a bond with his mother that people don't normally get. You need mm-hmm. to go and you need to talk to her. And so I would go mm-hmm. downstairs for like an hour and I would just talk. And we would talk, we would talk. And eventually, it took some time, but eventually I started asking her questions about being a housewife and a wife. Like mm-hmm. she would tell, teach me little tips and tricks how she gets ready, you know, a couple hours before her husband gets home. So she's freshly ready, you know, like fresh out the mm-hmm. shower and pretty and doing stuff. She's like, you don't have to be, you know, primped up and pretty all day because you have stuff to do. You got a baby, you got things mm-hmm. to do. I'm in school. She was like, so time it so that you still, you look beautiful for you that your husband can enjoy it and you can do it at a time that it's the most opportune time. And she taught me about you like getting your nails done and I have ways that you can do your own nails that you don't have to spend the money in. You know, you like to do hair and I can teach you about hair. And she really came in and helped me about like, as soon as he comes home, I know there's problems, but wait to talk to him about it. Like, just let him decompress and you'll have the time. Your husband cares about you. You know, you know, he likes little meals. Make sure you make them. So she really helped me into being a housewife because none of the women in my family were housewives, um, not not by choice. I mean, they were all career women, but given mm-hmm. some circumstances, they were. Um, mm-hmm. So I didn't know what that looked like to not have a career and be working because we met both of us in the military. So what does it look like to take care of a child and to be happy at home and blessed? Because Matthew told me earlier in our marriage that he wanted he would like for me to be a housewife. He's like, I'd like to provide a life for that you don't have to go out and work. I was initially like, mm, I work because I'm a woman that works, and that's what we did. We work. <laughs> you know, because I never, I never heard that before. I was like, I don't want to do. But I didn't realize how much of a blessing to have a husband that wants to provide so well that you don't have to. If you want to, you can. But I'm not, I'm not gonna be like we 50 50 go out there and do. It. So in realizing the blessing, mm-hmm. yeah. I really wanted to be a true provider. I was like, let me do my part. You know, let me learn about submission, which I know I don't know if people get to a question about that, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, you know, figuring out what truly is submission. What is it to be a wife? and communicate and when we first got there I know my mother-in-law was looking at me like Sayla's not confronting Matthew like why is it why is it because I wouldn't like and I told her I said listen I could not show who I was when I first got there because there were <laughs> conversations me and my husband be having behind closed doors and I'm like let's figure this out let's do this that I, I didn't feel comfortable first of mm-hmm. all we don't argue in front of people but mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. I always want to maintain <laughs> respect with him that I never, y'all are never going to be like, she's such a disrespectful wife. Like that's, that's never me. I never want him mm-hmm. to disrespect this. So I was very quiet about how I handled, however we handled stuff. Mm-hmm. She really spoke to me about living in, you know, silence. Like, you know, if you need to gather yourself before you speak, well, gather yourself, be quiet, do what you're supposed to do. Pray, go do what you do. Yes. You know, God will talk to him. He's a good man. So mm-hmm. <laughs> He's a good man. Uh-huh. <laughs> But you don't have to get everything together. Like, be a wife, be a woman. Stand mm-hmm. his power in that. He cares about you. He's like his father. He cares and wants to provide something good. And so she really helped me being a housewife and mentoring me in that way. And her and I, our personalities are a lot alike. I didn't realize until we got to know each other that her and I are very similar. The, the things that he loves the most about his mother are qualities that I have and vice versa. My favorite things about my father are mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it it paired really well. And she saw how alike we were. And she's always told me how appreciative she is that he married, you know, a woman like in that. I have been with him for the five years. I never thought about leaving. I don't know if y'all ever asked that, but I never thought about leaving for better. Oh. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I, just mm-hmm. out. I know I have faith in my husband, and his relationship with God that I know without a shadow of a doubt, Matthew's going to do and be everything God's called him to be. And I'm going to be right here supporting him. Mm-hmm. That's what we're going to do. If it has to take five years, if it had to take 10 years, I would have done what needs to be done because I know and I have enough faith in God, of course, but in my relationship with my husband that I'm like, he's worth it. And this marriage is worth it. There's nothing to give up. Like we were the best of friends and we're going to work this thing out and I'm going to be right here. But that's, that's, that's yeah. really awesome. Yes, that's good. And so like, because y'all had the frog, the room mm-hmm. over the garage for those who didn't hear us at the beginning. Mm-hmm. So did y'all have to share like the kitchen and 
did you basically have to eat what she cooked and you didn't do any cooking? How did y'all maneuver with that? So uh, first we'll go forward. So much home housewife teaching was going on and stuff started not to get done. I'm, I'm showing up at home. They still talking about, all right, and this is how you do this. this how, I'm like, what y'all been doing all day? But, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was like, hey, somebody's slipping on their duty. <laughs> 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 but it, it was good because I saw that, that was a relationship that was being uh, birthed. And uh, yes, all the common spaces. So living room, dining room, kitchen, garage, backyard, front yard, uh, parking, everything. If, if somebody's car is in front of somebody else and they got to get out and move and do and park on the street or things like that, everything was this. That's why I, I likened it to roommates, because even though we had we had our room, they had their bedroom. Mm -hmm. Every Thank other you. every other space was a shared space. We had our, we had our wow. bathroom. We had our own oh, bathroom. so y'all did have your own bathroom? The bathroom yeah. down the hall. That's why I was like, we got to walk down the hall. Which is right across oh. the middle. Yeah, right. Yeah. So um, there was that. But uh, 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 going back to elaborate on the cooking situation, it, it would get to a point where, where hey, uh, this is the meal that's being made. Whoever, whosoever was choosing to cook was choosing to provide that meal. And, oh. and it really, it really uh, turned out to be a, a, a profitable situation because, like, hey, I'm, I'm a grill today, so don't worry about dinner. And then, or or vice versa, however it was. And then there also was the freedom that if they chose, because they would have their date night, which really was beautiful because that was something that we encouraged them to do. We were like, y'all need to have a date night. If not every week, every once, every twice a week or, or every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Y'all just go out, have a good time. And, and then, you know, the house is safe. We're here. And so we really encouraged them and they made it like routine. And so if they go, go out and they eat, and do and have a night on the town since we're all adults mm -hmm. and you know we're not falling under their authority like we fall under their roof but not under their authority we can we can furnish a meal for ourselves so yeah. there was that beauty mm -hmm. that freedom of that that how it could flow it was, it was very it was very free in that aspect yeah if somebody wanted if y'all wanted what we have you can have some if we want what you have very many times that we would cook two separate meals because maybe they want this and we're like we want this or if she want if she made a meal and i was really tired i'm like i like cooking but you made this meal big enough you know, we'll all in there. So it was, it wasn't, I mean, I liked it. Of course, if, you know, when two people want to cook, you know, you might have to wait like, oh, I got the kitchen, but the communication was always there. Being with his parents and communicating was never, we never had like a problem. Us and his parents never had a problem. We were always good. They respected us, always let us feel like adults. The only you know, thing is like, let us know where you're going because they're big on safety. Mm -hmm. You know, they're yeah. going too long, especially me. If I go out at night, they're like, Sailor, let us know so that we know she should be home. Mm -hmm. All even figure things out, but I had struggles. <laughs> I, I just, just yeah. be honest. They, they would be like, uh, uh, when you coming back? When the door opens? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want to say. You gonna make sure your mom yeah. watch this. <laughs> yeah. But I, I would be, I'll be transparent. I let them not be like, is there anything that you need? No, we go. Okay. And so they would know that there was always lots of communication. So, so with that, and again, we we still here. So, how did this stand? at your parents impact your finance um mm -hmm. could you talk about that okay so remember i said i was in school yes, yes. So when i was in school to get my amp i went through the school like i never heard anything about aviation so i became god really blessed my heart to become a professional student i i'm a, I'm a forever student that's what i say I'm a, I'm a student of the game whatever it is i'm gonna learn it and keep going and mm -hmm. so i graduated highest honors got my amp and there was a career fair career fair Three days after I got my AMP, and I went, I talked to Boeing, GoJet, Breeze, uh, uh, PSA, all these different airlines, right? GE, all these places that have to do with aviation. And everybody was like, we want you to move across the country. We want you to go here and there. But we were pregnant at the time, and it was a high-risk pregnancy. And so moving across the country in the drop of a hat is not feasible when we're in the third trimester of a high-risk pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And mind you, we need finances on the morrow so mm -hmm. i was walking down the hall kind of kind of dejected you know after speaking to everybody getting my attire together and my resume and the campus executive director shout out to ashley odin mm -hmm. uh, the campus executive director she's pretty much like the president of our campus at norfolk aviation institute of maintenance um i was walking down the hall i was about to leave the career fair and she goes matthew how was how was the career fair did you hear any uh good news or any employers that you're interested in and I told her exactly what I just told you. She looked at me. She said, you were in the military, right? I said, yeah. She said, yes, you got uh, aviation experience, right? I said, yeah, that's all I did. She said, you ever thought about teaching? No, never. Never thought about teaching. Not even in my wildest dreams. She said, 
how about you come back Monday and I have a job interview set up for you. See if you like it. I came home, told my wife about it. She was all excited. She's like, oh my gosh, you just got your first job offer and you just graduated and got your MP three days ago. I was like, I know it's amazing. Look at God. When I showed up Monday and 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 hopefully uh, Ashley and, and Mr. Groom and all of them see this or, or even get to hear this sound bite. It was not a job interview. I walked in and they were like, so this is what you're going to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> it was a setup. <laughs> They're like, you're going to be teaching this class for this long with this many students. I was like, what? Sign right here. Okay. And I signed. And then, then we had our baby. It was like the next week we were, we were in and out of the uh, hospital just because, you know, the, the complications. And then I went on like a month of maternity leave. And when I came back, I shadowed uh, Miss Nancy Jones and uh, Mr. Lee and some of the other instructors who like, you know, I, I value dearly as a student, but now they're, they're talking to me like, we're coworkers, you know, mm -hmm. and really trying to hone in my aviation understanding, how, how to do the, the administrative side of this, not so much of the aviation information because you're now a professional in this, but how can you, you know, govern a classroom appropriate? How can you reach somebody when they're struggling? It's easy to teach a student who, who's willing to learn, but how can you reach that person who maybe needs a little bit of prodding? And so I learned that. And then immediately I was thrown into the fire where I was working I'm teaching the most advanced class setting at AIM, where it's the program is usually Monday through Thursday from 7.30 to 2. And the program I was teaching was Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 4. And I'm teaching every single block. And so we went through all these schools of thoughts and my students end up graduating and at the end, I high five. And when they saw that, I was good in that position where they really were gambling on me. They took a bet on me. They rolled the dice and said, let's see how this falls. And they saw it was profitable. They put me in other positions where now, you know, it brings some allure to the school and, and even what I'm doing right now. Well, let me, let me, I got to brag on him. He said, yeah, listen, that program is a 22 month program that originally that they had him teaching that it's compressing. So he went from doing a 22 month program as a student to having to teach that whole 22 month program in one year to students who are signed almost like the military. They're in a contract with Piedmont that Piedmont will pay for their schooling as long as they graduate, get their A&P and go to whatever airport. So he, I, I just need y'all to understand, he had to give them all two, almost two years information in one year and get it so that they can pass. Yeah. And, well, yeah, so and they, had to get, they had was doing that. They had to get understanding. I mean, that's the key thing right there. Uh, they had to get understanding of what you were teaching. So mm -hmm. evidently you gave them a uh, clear, concise, instruction because if they pass mm -hmm. yeah, right. it, it reflects you yes ma'am and so to highlight that the financial aspect in, in the original question was i got that job when you're still living with my parents so so mind you yes i'm now i'm, I'm a student turned instructor who uh -huh. is still at my parents house but now i just make more money and show up a little bit later at home and we're still doing the tithing we're still trying to you know tackle any types of obscure debts that we have, medical bills, things like that. Whatever it was, we were just searching through our finances to say, how can we get disciplined on this and tackle them? And that was what took us from like, it was like baby steps. Yeah, we had to save. Every time we save. save. Uh... Every time. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, if you, you live with your parents and you got this nice job, did y'all go into saving mode or did y'all go into we getting ready to have some fun mode? We went into saving mode and every time we save, the car, the children. At this point, I'm trying to think that Rosalina have asthma. We know she had asthma at the time. Rosalina, mm -hmm. we found out our daughter has, you know, had some, she was developing these delayed. So we're putting money into trying to get her the proper mm -hmm. therapies and, and speech therapy, mm -hmm. all these things. And it's like, we had some things in collections that we knew that we had already. So my mother-in-law, God bless her, had got us in contact with the Lighthouse program through the VA that tells you what your credit score is, as well as what you need it to be and what you need to pay down or do to get it to the score so that we can start this home loan process. We started mm -hmm. that in 2020, 2020 mm -hmm. we started talking to, talking to the Lighthouse people. They said that you had to pay off a debt that we owe to DFAS, credit cards, and then um, have three open lines of credit. We already had, what, one? Open line of credit. We were trying to save up for the um for the uh credit cards. The DFAS was a whammy because I didn't even know that we owed DFAS. Mm -hmm. And so we were saving up. My parents even threw in some money to help us for Christmas. They're like, here's you know, half of it, save up. And emergencies was happening. And then I asked you, I was like, Matthew, call DFAS so we can maybe start a payment because we took care of the credit. Do we take care of the credit card? We just took care of the credit cards that summer too. Yeah. 
2022, we took care of the credit cards. And that was, that took time. And so we were like, all right, let's handle the DFAS. And then Matthew called DFAS. I'll let you, I had told Matthew, call DFAS and let's try to get this payment. You can't get a federal uh, VA loan if you owe the exactly. government, you know? So Okay. Okay. So say that one more time, Sila, in case someone may be thinking about getting a VA loan. What was, what yeah. did you say you can't have if you want a VA loan? Oh, DFAS mm -hmm. or the government, right? You cannot just get a VA home loan. Um, you need to pay them back, especially specifically for us. Our DFAS was due to us getting out the military. You know, they give you your Diddy move or whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. And there's paperwork you're supposed to fill out when you get to your destination. We did everything with that dog on form when we got there mm -hmm. to let them know. So what they'll do is they'll put this hold on your account that you owe them this amount of money because they know you can't do too much with this on your account. You're going to have to contact them. And we waited, mm -hmm. we figured we have to save up this money to pay them. We didn't realize it was a, no, you need to call us. Let us know that you got to your destination oh. so that we mm -hmm. can lease the funds, clear out the um, account so that you can go. Well, they made a mistake. Like we called them. The girl was like, oh my gosh, you DFAS owes you guys all that money. And we're like, what? A Look woman. at us. We got, you know, da, 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 da. we got the money. They're about to put in our account. <laughs> and... The, wo the woman on the phone who is sitting behind the computer looking at the account was like, oh, it says DFAS actually owes you this money. Files it, told me everything to send in. We do all the paperwork. It was like a month later, I got a check in the mail, right? For the exact amount that she said. Mm -hmm. And then I just held the check because I was like, I don't know what, what I should do. But then, okay, I'm going to cash it because I, I remember explicitly her saying for you, then it's going to be zeroed out. Mm -hmm. And then it was like a month later, we were trying to go forward in the house, the home buying process. And they are like, hey, you still got a debt on your account for this <laughs> amount. And so I'm like, I called the lady back. She don't work there no more. And, <laughs> um, and the, gentleman yeah. says, the gentleman says, um, that check that you got was supposed to go directly back to the government. Like they were supposed to credit your account and then they were supposed to get the check and then it zeroes it. That's not what happened. I actually got the check. They were like, I don't know how you actually got the check. And so when I said, so whose fault is this? Am I going to have to pay this money back? She said, okay. you have to pay every dime back from this. And so it Mind was you. like, and it was like lump sum, no, no partial, no nothing. Yeah, no payment. And we're in the middle of the home buying process. Matthew's like, by the time we figured that part out, because yeah, when we got that check, we also got that check around Rosie's birthday. So we were like, let's give our baby the best birthday party ever. And did. And it was great. Mm. Now at this point in time, we're in the home buying process. The debt's still on our account, but we're like, it's going to, it's going to go. They, they told us it's going to go. It's fine. It's fine. And the underwriter's like, no, e, this is a debt. There. You need to call DFAS. DFAS is like, we, they did it wrong. You were, that was supposed to go to us. You have to pay us. And now we're at, towards the end. We have the home. Yep. We, the the, the, we the someone, signings on the 18th and we are two weeks away. We're two weeks away from and, closing. And they're like, you need to pay back this amount. And so God willing, matter of fact, in this time, then this is just from, you know, stewarding properly through through these years of being disciplined and like mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. We had the disposable funds, yeah, my but we had disposable funds planned for for another yeah. occasion for something else because we're in the home buying process. But ultimately, we had to uh, shift fire and just, uh, uh, you know, aim it to what they were saying. Right. And you got your you house. Got, well, yeah. That's yeah. Right. All right. But that's that's yeah, and I said, yeah, you got goal. your house. That was the end goal. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Right. yeah. He worked it out. Okay. Well, you know what? We are going to close out, but before we do, I want to ask you, Matthew, can you give some advice to the men out there when it comes to any advice you think they would would need that you can give? I'm gonna speak to two group of men. The first group of men are married or or, or entertaining to court a woman or seeking to have a fruitful relationship. If you want to keep going and have it keep growing, you got to die. And and to be clear on what type of death that is, and we need you need to have a whole funeral service. You need to die to the things that you hold to that people aren't going to move you off of, i.e. maybe your friend's advice over weighing what your, your woman can offer you, or bulldozing help when it actually can be beneficial. When you stop trying to be the end all be all every answer and you actually know when the time and place to say hey i need help or can i use your assistance in this regard you will grow exponentially it's like it's like getting on a speed track and going off a ramp 
because now your strength is in your perspective and understanding and not with just your ability. So use, use, the, use the village that is around you that God's given you the opportunity to have. And that is what will promote your fruit. And now to the second group, the second group are the adolescents who are 17, 18, 19 coming up. And you may not have a direction. You may not know where you're going or your whole identity is tied to where you've been. I'm going to let you know that where you've been does not dictate where you're going. And you need to take a hard look at everything that you are consuming through your gates, your eyes, your ears, and even the words that you project, because you may be, you may be painting the picture for your future without even knowing it. So be careful that the company you keep and also the things that you entertain daily, because Everything that you put down in, the, the, the first thing that you put down in at the bottom, when times get tough and you start having to dig out of that box, that first thing that you put in is going to be the last thing that comes out. So if you put in some uncertainty, some 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 self, some negative self-speech, some uh, degradation to relationships, to people around you, then that's going to be the thing that you actually have left to give when you're depleted. So put the good stuff in first and then let the other stuff just fall by the way. All right. Wonderful, wonderful. Now right. for you, yeah. Miss Thaler, I want you to give some words of advice or encouragement to a young lady who is married and mm -hmm. her husband at the time of being married may not be able to provide a home and you have to go and live with your in-laws. Can you give some advice to that woman? What I would say is, to her and even other women, you know, the best thing I think I could have ever done in my life to get my relationship sounds like such a text, but you don't understand. The joy of the Lord is something a house can't get your husband, friends can't, children, nothing can get you that. The joy of the Lord is something that is priced and it's something that you can choose with God, you know? And marriage is hard. Being a wife is hard. Life is hard. But when you have God, I'm not saying your life is just easier because that's, that's not. It, the attacks come and there's so much submission of flesh that has to take place. But now you have something that you can go to that is above every struggle, every everything that life has to offer. And mm -hmm. as a woman, it is so important that you root yourself in Christ so that when your husband is doing what he's supposed to, and maybe when he's not, because he's human, right? I'm, now, now, listen, I'm not talking about narcissism. I'm not talking about infidelity. I'm not talking about beating on nobody. I'm talking about people who have struggled. Husbands are going to, you can't put him on a pedestal. He's not God. You know what I mean? So as a wife and a woman, it is so important that you get that foundation with Christ all the way rooted in together so that when he is trying to be what he's supposed to be, you're rooted in God and you can go to God for what you're not going to friends, especially if you're married, married ladies, you're not going to friends, you're not going to mamas, you're not going to sisters. I'm not saying you can't talk to people. What I'm saying is God needs to be the first person that you run to because when you run to him with your problems, when you cry out to your heart, say everything on your mind, let him talk to you. And then let it be something you can share with family. You know what? Pray for me. I'm struggling. You know what, mom? I, I just really need a hug. You won't be dishonoring your husband in your marriage. Because mm -hmm. let's be honest, people close to us don't forget, even though we do, right? We as wives will for forgive. We love. We ain't happy. We good. And they like, uh-uh, didn't that -uh, happen? And you're like, well, yeah, that's <laughs> over. But you didn't already overshared all that. But if you would have given that all to God, God knows his heart. God's working on this man too and loves you both and isn't going to tell you nothing wrong, nor is he going to keep a grudge. What does it say? He takes the sins as far as the east is unto the west. When it's done, he's not going to hold nobody against. Him. And people can't quite do that. And I think so many times as women, I love to talk. I like to listen. I like to have conversation that we want somebody physically there to talk to and do not realizing that's not who we invite in. And so my best advice to every wife and woman is lean on God. Like truly make him the first thing in your life. That way, no matter what takes place in this marriage, mm -hmm. whether it works or it don't, you're solid in that and get through it and you're not alone in that. So many times we as women, and I'm speaking about myself right now, we want love from a man so bad that we make that our source of joy or attempt to make that for the whole only God. He put this man on a pet and he's human and he, and he, he can't get you the house. He don't make that much. Sometimes he get irritated. Maybe he don't even listen to God himself. I, I don't know. And it's like you put your faith and almost your life mm. in a human. There's a song lyric by Jonathan... I forgot his last name, but he Reynolds. Yeah, yeah. He was like, she took the last bit of hope I was storing. That's too much power for anything human. Deliver me. And that's the truth. You cannot put everything into a human being. Even somebody that loves you and cares about you, you got to put that into God. And when you do that, when they fall and make mistakes, you can forgive. 
when they when when you're struggling and you're down or he's down, you have something bigger than you that you can lean on that you don't find yourself so desperate from love from somebody that they he can't even give me the love that God gives me. Yes, mm -hmm. God calls you to love your wife like Christ loves the church, but he's gonna fall short. And when he falls short, that's okay because God got it. and God fills that hole in me so well inside my heart and my soul that when he fails or falls short, the, the, it's not the end of the world. Lord, what do we do? Lord, I'm frustrated. Lord, I need to pray for him. God help me. Well, Selah, actually, you need to da, 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 da. I'm gonna handle that. You know what I mean? And it's like you can't listen to God and do what God has called you to do to walk in your purpose as a woman and as a wife if you've decided that you are gonna put him first and everything's just gonna be in him. It's not on him. It is on him because he's, you know, God has a role for him, but you need to lean into God. God loves you and your husband more than you can love y'all. Period. Nothing surprises him. He sees it all, knows it all from beginning to end. And maybe you don't have the house right now, but pray to God and see. Just pray to God and see. God told us to wait for years. Every time I fasted, the answer. But okay, God. All right, Lord. I trust you, God. I trust you, God. And work on that faith and trusting in him so that if he tells you to wait, if he tells y'all not right, go stay with you. See what he wants us to gain from that. Because I feel like in those five years, there was something God wanted us to learn at every step of the way. And had we just been focused on, we want the house, we want the house, we want the house. We're missing out on the things that God is really trying to grow and do in us and the blessing he wants us to be to others. So it's that relationship with God. You have to, and you have to do it for yourself. Do it for yourself. Spend time in the word, worship, pray, talk to him and get in community with women who also feel the same way. Be careful. Like Matthew said, what you're putting into, you know, what you're watching, what you're listening to. I'm not saying you can't ever listen or do anything. What I'm saying is make sure that you are filling yourself up with things of God that are encouraging you to go to that direction. When things are hard, we turn to him instead of the desires of our flesh. I just feel like doing so many times as women. I feel like, well, I just feel like, basically my phrase, Matthew's. <laughs> I just feel like, you know what you feel like, but feelings aren't facts and they're temporary, right? And so we as women have to have to acknowledge what we feel like, but rely on the promise and hold on to that so that when the feelings rise up, they can submit to the truth of who God is, who he's called us to be, what it is. And we can operate how you're supposed to. Because I don't know about y'all, but I don't like being wrong. So <laughs> if I offer God, he's called None of us probably do. You know what I mean? I can be in the right. I'm joking. But you know what I mean? You want to be in right standing with the Lord. He has enough grace to cover you. He not. But this relationship with God, that's that's that. Oh, yeah. Wonderful, yeah, wonderful. Well, well, thank you. Well, thank y'all for, for joining the money talk. This was great. Matthew and Sailor, we really appreciate y'all time. Um, and I'm sure we might even have to do this again. It might be yeah. a part two to this. Yeah, so. we are probably going to do part two. Yeah. This was really good. It was really good. So thank y'all very much. Yeah, so from the Money Talk, we say thank you so much for joining us. If you listeners enjoyed our show, we ask that you share, subscribe, and like it. And we will be back next week with another episode to talk about money. money. <laughs> All right, thank you, Matthew and Sailor. Bye.